If you can make a calculated decision that results in something that could be a positive outcome, uh, find a way to do it as soon as you can. Trying to do it on your own without the people around you to learn from just extends the path. And so surrounding yourself with the right people has really contributed to the growth of our businesses in a, in a fast manner. Welcome everyone to the Road Less Traveled Show. This is a show about people that were successful in a previous career and left that career to go down a different path. I'm your co-host, Richard Coyne. I'm your co-host, Bill Zimmer. On show, we're so pleased to have Emily Courtright and Adam Roberts. Welcome, Emily and Adam. Hey guys, thanks, thanks for having us. Thank you, Richard. Thanks, Bill. Absolutely. Well, Emily, Adam, again, thank you again for being on the uh, Road Less Traveled Show. Um, to start with, um, whoever would like to start with the, the initial question, we'll go from there, but uh what was your like initial job you were in the W-2 world and then what have you transitioned into? Absolutely. So Adam and I started the, on a very traditional path. We were both engineers by schooling and we started at GE Aviation in a, in a rotational program. So we were moving around the country every six months and working our way up, up the ladder at GE when GE put our businesses up for sale. And we were living in Southern California at the time. And it was one of those uh, like knife in the heart moments. Like I never expected to, to be sold off. I thought I was going to be working for GE for 30 years. because Both my parents were 30 to 40 year employees for the same company. And so that was really instilled in both of us from an early age. Uh, but but there were other plans for us. And, and GE selling off our business was actually one of the best things that ever happened to us. Yeah. Excellent. And then what, what have you transitioned into once uh, once you left GE? Yeah, so after uh, leaving GE, uh, we moved to Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, I found another aerospace job. And when we got here, Emily, she, uh, she didn't go back to her corporate world. She started just flipping houses and building up a small rental portfolio. So we, we, we entered the world of, re of real estate investing uh, on the single family scale. Uh, bought a small fourplex and, um, you know, we did maybe five or six uh, home renovations a year and we kept some of those as rentals and we sold the others off. And uh, we did that for about uh, five or six years uh, up until the market here in Texas got a little crazy. And uh, then we jumped into multifamily investing and we've been doing multifamily, lar large multifamily communities um, since 2017. Nice. Excellent. What uh, what geographic areas are you investing multifamily? Is it still in Texas, or have you branched out? Yeah, our uh, the, the deals where we are the lead investors are in Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, and Oklahoma. Um, we have some other holdings as limited partners in um, uh, Atlanta, Georgia, Florida, um, and Colorado. Colorado. So we diversify more so with our passive investments. Uh, with the, the properties that we lead, we try to make them at least driving distance away. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. yeah, that does make a lot of sense. That's kind of our approach as well. You know, we we are we're glad to get into uh, things that are drivable. You know, we'll look at some other markets occasionally that are a little bit beyond that, but that's a that's a different conversation. So mm -hmm. um, anyway, well, that, that makes sense. So um Emily, Adam, maybe both of you have a short story, but, uh, you know, maybe go back to your engineering days. Is there a funny story? Something happened to you along the way? You know, I think looking back, one of the most impactful stories that I have was when we were living in Southern California, Adam invited me to an investing class and I was going to meet him there after work that day. And I, I show up and I go to the, it's at a hotel and I go to the concierge. I'm like, where's the investing class? And he's like, do you mean the real estate class? I'm like, no, no, no. Like the investing class. <laughs> and he's like, well, we only have a real estate class tonight. So he sends me up to the third floor. I get off the elevators. I see Adam standing outside the room and I look at him and I go, what are we doing here? Like, we're not going to invest in real estate. And he's like, no, no, just come in, just listen. And he had luckily read Rich Dad, Poor Dad uh, mm -hmm. earlier, and this was a Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad training. And so I was really hesitant because I had I knew no one that had invested in real estate. It, nobody in my family did. Uh, but that two hour class literally changed our lives. And mm -hmm. it opened my mindset to show me how real estate investing can provide financial growth and security for the future. And so it's 
to me, I look back and I say, you know, I, I feel like I was pretty closed minded when I walked in those doors, but I left having a whole new mindset and appreciation for real estate. And now here, 10 years later, we are full time real estate investors. It's going to provide mm-hmm. financial freedom for us. So I encourage everybody to to seek out that that training that, you know, those two hours could change the rest of your life. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, you know, Bill and I are huge believers in education, which is one of the reasons why we did this podcast. We do other things with our local RIA, et cetera, as well. But, you know, but again, you're right. It, it, you know, people people are so bombarded with stock market, 401k, you know, invest with fidelity and blah, 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 you know. And, and again, I'm not saying those aren't good investments and not saying that, you know, you can't do well there. But I think you're going to, I think it's been proven that you would do better if you're taking a little more control, but that's work. And, you know, the busy professional a lot of times doesn't have the time to do any work, right? They're so busy with, you know, staying at top of the, you know, the heap and the competitive nature of corporate America, as well as, um, you know, trying to support their family, et cetera, that, you know, I was that busy professional for years and years and really didn't do a lot on the investing side, you know, a little bit of 401k stuff. Um, but, you know, you can do really well with real estate. And, and, and actually, I think history has proven that, you know, most people that are very, very wealthy, seven, eight, 10 figures, you know, have done so with a heavy reliance upon real estate to help to get them there. And, um, you know, so and and again, back to what you're saying earlier about you thought you guys were going to were lifers at, uh, at GE and, and you know, it didn't plan, pan out that way. And I think that obviously speaks to the fact that, you know, as Bill and I talk about, we recommend that, you know, people, if you love your W2 job, awesome, do well at it, provide for your family you know, help the company grow. But at some point in time, do something else. Build up another stream of income in some way that will help give you some options. And again, because unfortunately, corporations have no loyalty toward employees. I mean, I think the flip side, the companies would say the same about employees, but at the same point in time, they're just, there's no more company pensions. You know, there's no more job for life kind of thing. And, uh, you know, so definitely keep your options open. So, yeah. There's also a lot of uncertainty out there. So even if you were working for a company for 20, 30, I mean, I worked with a bunch of guys, you know, who were years, just just a few short years from retirement and then they get laid off or, yeah, you know, yeah. the, the the facility would move something completely outside of their control. Right. And so, yeah, there's a lot of uncertainty. You just can't be flat footed about it. Right. Right. Absolutely. Well, what would, um, I guess, kind of circling back to a deciding factor that, that made you want to change career. Some of it was decided for you. It sounded like when GE decided to, to divest the uh, division. Um, but like in your case, you didn't go back into aerospace when you moved to Fort Worth. You decided to get into real estate. So what was kind of deciding your thought process on that? And why did, you know, other than was it just the Rich Dad seminar by itself? Or did you met other investors and realize this was a possible avenue for you? Or how did that kind of transpire? Part of the decision making for us was that, Adam was actually a little bit further along in his career at GE. So as a a marketable employee, he found a better paying job in Fort Worth uh, than what we were making out in California. And the uh, cost, the the living cost in Fort Worth was so low that we knew we could live on his one paycheck. Mm -hmm. So we kind of said, well, he's more marketable. Uh, He'll stay in a corporate job. I'll be the one to branch off and go start our real estate business. And so the first things I did was I read, I read a book on flipping houses. I read a book on rental properties. I got my real estate license and then we just hit the ground running and Mm -hmm. we started marketing, started building that business. And it was at a time when you could buy good investment properties on the MLS. So we were very lucky that it was a great period of time to Mm -hmm. be investing in the DFW market. But the, yeah, the really the decision making was we knew we had been tracking our expenses for probably three years at that point, and we knew what we needed to live on, and we knew that his single paycheck in Fort Worth meant that we would at least break even. We wouldn't have to move back in with mom and dad. We could survive, and so it was a very, um, I would say, educated and intentional decision that we could we could go down to one paycheck. Nice, nice. So when you were kind of getting this engine going with with Emily on the real estate side, um, you know, you said you you read a book on Burr, uh, at least at least flipping, and then you uh, you started doing some single families. What, what were some obstacles you had to overcome along that along that time frame? 
You know, I think one of the biggest obstacles for me personally was that as an engineering background and and I had no marketing background. Mm -hmm. They don't teach engineers how to be marketers. (laughs) And so that was one of the biggest struggles for me was designing the letters, you know, marketing myself, learning that business. It was back in the day when there, I feel like there weren't virtual assistants Uh, you know, we were physically mailing yellow letters. And I would say for me, that was one of the biggest uh, obstacles. Uh, But on the flip side, what was a really interesting parallel was that at GE, I was managing um, different operations, like a paint shop, an assembly shop. um, And so there were different different trades that I had. I had welders, I had sheet metal formers, I had machinists. And then when I got into flipping houses, it was very similar in the fact that I was managing roofers and flooring installers and foundation guys. And it was still just a project management kind of atmosphere where there's a quality and cost and a timeline and and it all has to line up. Right, right. Nice, okay, makes a lot of sense. Well, uh, Emily and Adam, um, as you guys transition more from the W-2 into the full-time real estate investing side of it, can you think back to what one of your like your first victories for you that really cemented in your mind that this was an achievable path and we can we can scale this? Yeah, I, you know, for me, uh, I did <clears throat> in our real estate business because I was working full-time and because Emily had a, a, a real estate license, I actually worked with a lot of the home sellers right um in a case we didn't want emily to walk in and and be a real estate agent if we wanted to buy their house then i would interface with them and um you know kind of going back to emily's story about being a salesperson or, or you know stepping outside your comfort zone we uh you know we found a very good i would say approach to working with sellers who wanted to sell their house say pre market or without dealing with real estate agents and then like Emily said, at this point in time in Fort Worth and Dallas Fort Worth, you could actually list an investment property on on the market with a real estate agent and get and get good price. Um, and 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 there was actually a market for that. But for me, I knew that we had 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 really succeeded in this new space. I went to visit a home in a very good neighborhood, and uh, you know, a three bed, two bath asset. And I went to meet with the seller directly and the seller was an older gentleman um, who needed to, you know, downsize, potentially move into assisted living. And, you know, here I am. I'm still in an engineering job, by the way. So I left my I left my engineering job early. I put the spreadsheets away and the designs and all that to go to talk to this person and to just really feel out what they were looking for out of the transaction and to be there to provide that solution. It all culminated at the very end of the meeting when he asked me, um, Hey, so, you know, what do you think this place is worth? And of course, typical engineer, I wanted to like get my calculator out or I wanted to get my spreadsheet out or, you know, just so I wouldn't be like losing money in this deal. And, uh, and he says, uh, he says, what do you think it's worth? And, And I said, well, you know, I think it's worth about $80,000. And I, I was just, I mean, that just came just from my head at that point. And he says to me, he says, yeah, I think it's worth 80000 too. And uh, I said, okay. So we, we <laughs> got the contract done right there. And uh, luckily when I went back to the spreadsheet, of course, the engineer in me was very you know nervous to drive home. I'm like, gosh, what if, what if I'm losing money in this deal? But luckily, luckily, it was it was a black number at the end of the day. You know? okay. So at that point, I knew we could we could replicate that, and uh, and I could talk to people in in a let's call it a salesperson type of uh, uh, mindset. Yeah. <clears throat> so that that price still left enough money for renovation costs yeah. no, and, yeah. for, and for profit. So good, mm-hmm. nice, nice, very nice. Um, so is is there uh, uh, so Adam? Are you still in? in uh, aerospace no so when we transitioned into multifamily, we did we did that because of a couple reasons one the single family market was getting hugely competitive it was frothy didn't feel comfortable with the margins so we were looking for something different um from that standpoint and we knew that single family was just too linear i i wasn't a we weren't able to get ahead quick enough build the business fast enough to the point where i could also join Emily full time. 
And so we went searching for something different. We looked at commercial real estate investing. We looked at mobile home parks, a bunch of different stuff. We settled though on large apartment communities um, because of, you know, the ability for us to actually manage the assets with, you know, manage the property managers, you know, that would then become kind of more of my full-time job. It was compensated much better than my engineering job. Um, And so, yeah, I left, uh, I left my W2 back in 2018 when we jumped into multifamily. Good for you. Good for you. So um, in your, in your multifamily days recently over the past couple of years, is there a funny story you guys can share? Yeah, recently. um, Oh, I don't know if it's funny, but it's definitely, it's, it's definitely, (laughs) it makes a lot of people laugh. Uh, We had, and this had, this literally happened over the time span of about 30 days. Um, Today in our portfolio, we have seven apartment communities and in one month, we had a property in Oklahoma get hit with a tornado. We had a property in Dallas have an entire building burn to the ground, 12 units. Mm. And uh, we had another property down the street in Dallas where somebody um, uh, filed a lawsuit against us for an incident that happened in a laundry room. And uh, so it just goes to show it's not... uh, you know, apartment investing is definitely a lifestyle business. You can make it a very, you know, very nice, lucrative lifestyle business where you can call your own schedule, be your own boss. But man, it gets busy sometimes. And so uh, two different insurance claims, um, working with 12 total insurance carriers across those two properties. Uh, and of course, another insurance claim now filed for the lawsuit. So it's, uh, yeah, like I said, it's not necessarily a funny story, but a lot of people chuckle when they hear the details about it. Oh man. Yeah. That's, that's unfortunate. I mean, again, you know, you can't, uh, it, obviously I you know, hope everything's turning out okay with yeah. you know, with all, all these different I- issues and incidents. Uh, but, but at the same point in time, something's going to happen at some point. It and will. You, yeah. yeah. And you obviously just have to make sure you have the proper insurance to deal with it, et cetera. And then obviously, uh, pick up and move on. So yeah. Yeah, for sure. I'm Earn, earning my paycheck these days. <laughs> well, uh, speaking of these days, uh, where, where are you guys in your journey now? You, you like to transition from the, the single family, you did some LP investing and got in the GP side of it and expanding larger and larger units. Um, so kind of where are you today and what's, what's your, your outlook? Where are you hoping to be in a few years? Yeah. So we, we currently own, we have our, our GP portfolio, our passive investments. And what we looked at last year, at the end of 2022, we looked at our portfolio and based on some guidance from one of our mentors, we realized that we were very, very heavily invested in multifamily, which is understandable because that's been our primary business the last six years. But it was to the point where it was like 90 to 95% of our investable assets. And so we looked at ourselves and we said, we need to be a little bit more diversified. Mm -hmm. And so about a year ago, we identified notes, mortgage notes and private lending as an opportunity to bring in more cash flow. Because one of the market dynamics from our multifamily investments is that the cash flow has actually gone down over the years from the investments that we're in based on property taxes going up, insurance, interest Mm -hmm. rates, things like that. And so the cash flow that we thought we were going to get off the multifamily was not as strong as it could have been. And so we have now branched um, very, I would say, pretty heavily into mortgage notes, private lending, um, promissory notes, that whole banking business. And it was really interesting because we we had one rental property left from our portfolio. The tenant moved out at the end of last year and I knew I didn't want to renew the lease. I knew I didn't want to be a landlord anymore for single family. So I looked at selling it, but I also looked at selling it owner finance Mm -hmm. in the mentality of let's be the lender. Let's be the bank. Let's enjoy these, this cash flow like the bank does every month. And so it was pretty phenomenal because we ended up selling it owner finance. I would have made about 1200 a month on it as a rental property But as the lender, I'm making over $1,700 a month. And I don't get called when the air conditioner breaks, when the washer overflows. You know, I'm not subject to the changes in the interest or the uh, property taxes and insurance. 
And so it was a really phenomenal case study that really opened our eyes to say, in this current market, we can actually cash flow more by being the lender than we can by being the landlord. And so that's where we've started to reposition some of our assets just to kind of balance out our personal portfolio. Nice. Yeah, that's great. Um, so, and you're still holding the note on that. You haven't, you know, mm -hmm. uh, secured, you know, you haven't sold the note off yet. All right. It, and, and that is an option at some point, but but at this point you're holding the note. Got it. Yes. Mm -hmm. We're holding the notes for cash flow. Which again, keeps you out of the actual, you know, you're not the owner of the property. You, you're you're yeah. the, you're the bank. So mm -hmm. the other, the owner of the property has to deal with all those things, including the property taxes. So nice. Very nice. So, um, so Emily and Adam, is there something that you can uh, talk about that you either do personally or through your business that you do to give back and in, in a way to help others? Yeah, you know, both Emily and I uh, professionally give back to certain organizations. Uh, Emily teaches a lot of investing classes through the um, brokerage that she hangs her real estate license at, Keller Williams. Okay. And so Keller Williams has actually been very progressive the past several years, trying to get their agents to become more real estate investors. Uh, so she'll teach probably three, four classes a month um, to the Keller Williams organization, just about how to, you know, how to be the agent, but also be the investor in, in certain right. scenarios. Um, I, uh, <clears throat> I, I actually am a, am a coach for an apartment investing organization. So uh, our, our organization has maybe about a thousand members in it. And, uh, and so for the students that are coming up the curve of learning how to be an apartment investor, I give back by uh, spending time with them and, and making sure that we're uh, getting them to where they need to be before they're investing all their hard earned cash into multifamily investments. So that's professionally, I would say personally, we're, uh, we're part of a, um, a, a wheelchair distribution organization called Chair the Love. Mm -hmm. And uh, Chair of the Love uh, travels to um, mostly Hispanic uh, South American countries and distributes uh, wheelchairs for people who need mobility. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was really cool for us because even though we do come from charitable families, it was mostly just like financial charity and giving money. But this is actually, you know, you could take 150 bucks and buy a wheelchair and actually hand it to the person who who needs it, help them into it. So it was, it was super impactful for us. And we continue to work with that, that organization today. And I also run a charity golf tournament uh, mm -hmm. here locally in the Dallas Fort Worth area that benefits an organization called Spokes for Hope. And Spokes for Hope is, they are kind of a liaison between police officers and the community. They give bicycles to the police officers to give out to any children, any child in need that they see across North Texas. And so it helps bridge that uh, that gap in the relation. It builds the relationship between the police officers and the community children. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, I really find it um, surprising how, um, how few real estate um, agents are actually also investors. You know, with, with the, especially the longer they've been in the business, you know, they, you sell that same house multiple times, you watch it rise in value over time. You know, at some point you're like, that probably wouldn't be good to hold on to that asset for 10 years and I would have doubled my money or or better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great that uh, your your brokerage is so progressive on on uh, uh you know instituting that that kind of uh you know training and knowledge to help everybody out, you know, helps helps them be everybody more invested in that process. So Emily and, and uh, what's Adam, what's what's something you've recently implemented that has helped your business grow? Anything you know, you the, the teaching, we have really grown that side of the business in the past year because it helps us get one in front of, it helps us teach other people about investing, but it also helps us gain passive investors. Mm -hmm. So we offer investing opportunities uh, in multifamily and in notes, private mortgage notes, promissory notes. And so the teaching on both sides of the spectrum allows us to get in front of new audiences and kind of ex expand our network, expand our database and get to know more people that we can then help. We've mm -hmm. to date, we've currently helped over 900 people start or enhance their real estate investing journey by uh, giving them opportunities to invest in real estate. So we want to continue to grow that number. We want to reach a thousand by the end of the year. And the the teaching, picking up the teaching has really helped in that goal. Excellent. Very good. Very good. 
So uh, what, what Emily, Adam, maybe two different answers, maybe one. Uh, what advice would you give somebody who's considering making a path change? Well, you know, for me, um, especially since I had the opportunity to watch Emily jump in first while I maintained, you know, the W-2, for me, I always tell folks, just just do it. I mean, it's got to be a calculated decision. There's always anxiety around that. Um, and of course, the, some of the students I teach in our multifamily organization are, are considering these types of decisions. And it always revolves around something, a, a path, to your point, a path change that they want to make. And they've benchmarked it numerous times and versus, say, something they're more comfortable with or a financial decision. I always tell folks, hey, if you can make a calculated decision that results in a, um, you know, positive outcomes or something that could be a positive outcome, just do it. Uh, find a way to do it as soon as you can. You know, when we when we jumped, uh, when we changed paths from single to multifamily, and I was faced with the decision to leave my job, it wasn't a one for one. It wasn't like, oh, now I can make the same amount of money in multifamily that I. No, like we actually had to get a couple properties, you know, before. But but I left when we got one property, and I said, you know what? Even though we're even though we might have a net negative at the end of the year, now we can go faster. I can get the second property sooner. We can build faster. And so I don't think any sort of path changes is, is, is the timing's right or it's comfortable. There's always a good excuse. Um, mm -hmm. Just do it is usually what I say. And for me, I feel like our success has really stemmed around surrounding ourselves with the right people. Even from my very first conversations with my, my the KW office that I was joining, I asked them, do you have other investors that I can learn from? And the answer was absolutely yes. We, you know, mm -hmm. this gentleman does flips, this gentleman does uh, rental properties. And I learned from the people around me. When we switched to multifamily, we joined an ecosystem to be surrounded by other people who were investing in multifamily. When we jumped into notes, we surrounded ourselves with note investors. We joined another note ecosystem. And so I really think trying to do it on your own without the without the people around you to learn from just extends the path. And so surrounding yourself with the right people for me, I think has has really contributed to our our success and the growth of our businesses in a in a fast manner. Excellent. Yeah. Well, Emily, Adam, what's uh, the best way for our listeners to be able to reach out and learn more about what you guys have going on in the note investing or the multifamily side of it? You know, the easiest way to get in touch with us is through our website, uh, www.aeinvest.net. And we're super quick about getting back with folks who reach out to us that way. And AE stands for Adam and Emily. So it's very <laughs> creative. AE Invest. Brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. Yes. Well, excellent. we'll link those in the show notes below. Well, uh, Emily and Adam, we uh, we appreciate you guys being on the Road Less Traveled show today. Really enjoyed the conversation and wish you continued success. Yeah. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Richard. We really appreciate it. Honored to be on. Thank you so much. Absolutely. We appreciate you being on. Uh, we also want to thank our listeners. Please continue to give us a five-star rating so we can bring you more great content like our show today with Emily Courtright and Adam Roberts. Thanks again for being on. Uh, we want to run everybody have a couple important things that Park Capital Partners has going on. First, we have the Park Capital Value Add Fund, which is a 506C fund open today to accredited investors. Second, we have the Park Capital Partners Foundation, which is a 5013C nonprofit that Bill and I created as another way that we give back. Um, the way that works quickly is first Bill and I fund it. So all the money donated goes to do its best work, which is to help others. Second, we donate personally. Third, we donate corporately. And finally, when investors invest with us in one of our projects, we make a donation to honor that investor to a pre-selected list of 15 different charities. So please reach out to say hello. Uh, happy to have a conversation anytime. ParkCapitalPartnersLLC.com. ParkCapitalPartnersLLC.com. And again, Emily and Adam, thanks for joining again. Um, remember, folks, the road less traveled may be calling you. We recommend that you listen and take action. Thanks for joining.